seeing the world in a different way. Welcome to another Text to Nation interview. I'm Fred Fishkin, and with me are Princeton professors J. Richard Gott and Robert Vanderbay, and what they, along with Drexel University's David Goldberg, have created is a revolutionary new map of the Earth, a double-sided disk that provides more accurate distances than we've seen before on flat maps. Thank you for joining us, Richard and Bob. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, so thinking back to, to public school, my public school days, I'm remembering the maps that my teachers would pull down like window shades uh, covering up the blackboards. So perhaps uh, Richard, who is a professor emeritus of astrophysics at Princeton, you can start out describing what the problem with exist what the problems are with existing maps and what the solution is. Well, um, we want flat maps. Why do people take the trouble to have them is that a globe is a three-dimensional object. It's expensive to make. You have to carry it around. A flat map is uh, you can stack them. You can easily manufacture them. You can put them, slip them into the pages of a book. So um, flat maps are very valuable to have. However, the earth is a curved surface and it's impossible to perfectly display the curved surface of the earth on a flat map. So you're always gonna have some errors. And so what are those errors and how can you minimize them? Well, the, the, that map your teacher uh, pulled down from the wall was undoubtedly a Mercator projection, which is the one they used in high schools uh, you know, through, throughout for ages. Um, and that map, uh, there's, so I'll tell you what the principal errors are. Uh, one is uh, local shapes. That's, uh, you know, like how good does Iceland look? How good does New York City look? Uh, and local regions, are the shapes good? The Mercator projection is perfect in that. Uh, and it's used nowadays as the base map for Google Maps uh, because if you hone in on one tiny little area by zooming in on it, the, the shapes there will be good. Uh, the second one is area though. The, the Mercator projection depicts area badly because uh, Greenland looks as big on the Mercator map as South America. And uh, it's about one seventh of the area of South America. So in the polar regions, things are way too big. Um, that's the second area, and area error. Um, Goldberg and I identified further areas. One is called flexion. Uh, if you draw a great circle route on the map, that's a straight line path that an airplane would fly, let's say from New York to Tokyo. That shortest distance um, goes uh, over Northern Alaska. And as you can imagine on a Mercator map, it, 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 that's a bent line, it's bent. It shouldn't be bent, it should be shown straight on the map. So uh, uh, that means that there's a bending error, which we call flexion. Uh, and uh, cartographers have known about this error. And the next one is called um, lopsidedness. Uh, that is that on the Mercator map, Canada is too big, it's in the Arctic, and Mexico is too small relative to the United States. So North America is lopsided toward the north. I have been in the geographical center of North America, and it's in North Dakota, but on the Mercator map, you'd think this was somewhere in Canada, right? <laughs> because Canada is too big. So it makes North America lopsided to the north. Um, the next error is distances. You would like to stretch a string on your map between two cities and get the correct, uh, a good distance between the two of them. And so that's a distance error. Uh, and uh, the final error is the boundary cut error. The Mercator map is cut. Uh, you cut the, to make that map, you have to cut the earth along a, a longitude line that goes pole to pole. You're doing surgery on the map. You're cutting that longitude line at the, at the, um, uh, of the uh, international date line, 180 degree cut, and then you unroll the map. And so that cut appears at the far left of the map and the far right of the map. So, so uh, for example, uh, if you display, uh, Hawaii would be close to the left-hand side of the map, and Japan would be all the way over toward the right-hand side of the map. And so they look very, if you stretch a string between them, they look very far apart. But actually, 
rather than being a distant neighbor to the uh, to the west of Japan, uh, Hawaii is its nearest neighbor to the east. So the distance to, from Hawaii and Japan is, is rather largely wrong. And uh, of course, as you get uh, two points very close to the date line on either side, the, the error is enormous because those two lines are far separated on the map and they're actually zero separation. They're exactly adjacent to each other on the globe. Uh, so Goldberg and I, a mathematically quantified these errors. There's six of them, and um, this, and so we could rate map projections. And so we went through all the um, known map projections, famous ones, including some not so famous ones, uh, to see which one actually minimized the sum of the squares of those errors. Uh, this is what we do when we uh, map match models of things in cosmology. It's an idea that goes back to uh, uh, Gauss, a uh, mathematician. And so uh, we, wanna, we, want, we don't wanna make one error particularly bad. So if you do, let's say shapes perfectly, the areas are bad. So what you really want is a compromise projection that'll make the sum of the squares of those errors as small as possible. Okay, a globe, by the way, would have an error of zero because it's perfect. So we're looking for a low number here. So the, uh, the best map projection that we could find that was previously published ones was the Winkle triple. Maybe you can put it up on your screen. Um, the Winkle triple uh, is a map that looks like one of those very old fashioned television sets. <laughs> um, it is the North Pole is a line at the top. A South Pole is a line at the bottom. And the, the sides of it bulge out along the equator. And, and it has better, better areas than at the poles because they're shown smaller. And it does better than the Mercator map. The Mercator map has an error score of uh, over 8.2 on our scale. And this Winkle triple is 4.563. So it's, it's, it's the best one that we could, that, that on our error score that Goldberg and I came up with. And that was developed, I understand, almost exactly a hundred years ago. Oh, the Winkle Triple. It was in the I I don't know the exact date, but I would I would say it was in the early early half of the of the twentieth uh, century. It's a it's a um, it's a compromise projection uh, that has errors in areas and distances, but aims to to um, uh, depict both as well as possible. Now, the interesting thing about that projection that our method said was the best one was it was already the uh, a projection that the National Geographic Society is and had been using uh, for its world maps. So it has a, our, our, uh, that makes our error method have a, what we would call a face validity. It's picked a reasonable choice for the, for the best map. Now, um, uh, another thing I was going to mention was that the, um, uh, the uh, let's consider a, a different way to make uh, maps. Um, uh, Buckminster Fuller popularized polyhedral globes. Um, he started off with a, um, with a uh, what's called an, an icosahedron. This is, uh, this is roughly, um, uh, uh, you, you know, similar. Uh, to a globe. And, and the nice thing about this is you can take scissors to it, cut it apart, and lay it flat. These are flat faces. So you, you just rip it apart and spread it out. And you got a bunch of triangles. It looks like kind of a dragon shaped thing on your page. Uh, but it's got a very large boundary cut. It, is, uh, it, it rips the oceans completely apart. He tries to keep the continents on these triangular faces as well as he can. But the transoceanic distances are bad, and Arctic is way over here, and way over here, and, and, and Australia is very far away from it, so the distances are bad. Uh, this would get an error score uh, from Goldberg and me of over 15. So it has a large boundary cut error. The local shapes and things are good, but the, it loses out because of its terrible boundary cut error. So um, the Winkle triple looks like uh, uh, you're getting to a law of diminishing returns uh, in improving on that. And, and Richard Feynman said, when that occurs in physics, 
um, usually the old tricks don't work anymore to give you significant improvement. Um, the, the new trick, the thing that causes a significant improvement is usually something that's completely unlike anything you've tried before. So what we've done here is something uh, radically different. We've decided to use uh, both sides of the piece of paper. <laughs> so we have a two-sided map. And, and, and here it is. Um, this is, um, um, uh, it looks like phonograph record. And um, it has the Northern Hemisphere on one side with the North Pole in the center. The longitude lines spread out evenly uh, from it. And the distances on the, the scale along those longitude lines is constant as you go out. We found, we had to find out what the best way to depict the Northern Hemisphere was uh, to lower theirs. And this was the answer that we came up with. Um, and, and then on the other side is the Southern Hemisphere and the equator goes around the, around the edge. So if you have two cities, and you want to measure the distance between them, you just stretch a string between them, or you stretch a, a string tight across the phonograph record on the other side. Because if you were an ant, you could crawl from the top side over the edge onto the bottom side, and those two cities would be close together to each other on the map as they are on the globe. So, so this is the um, uh, uh, new trick, you might say. Uh, is to utilize, which doesn't usually get utilized, the back of the sheet of paper. And it's a round map, that's the best shape. And uh, this, this has a remarkable property that it, its score, its error score, by the way, is 0.881 relative to 4.563. Uh, so, so it's much better than the, um, than the Winkle triple. And the reason is it has the correct topology of the sphere. Bob will talk about that in a minute. Um, it, it, um, uh, it has a remarkable property in that the distances between pairs of cities as measured by string connecting them on this map is an error by most plus or minus 22.2%. It's bounded. It doesn't blow up anywhere. On the Mercator map, it blows up at the poles. Two people close together up at the North Pole are, are shown a large distance apart on the map when actually they're standing close to each other. And the same thing is true with a boundary cut. If you're on two, two friends standing on opposite, about ready to shake hands on the opposite side of a boundary cut at the, at the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, they're on opposite ends of the map. So the, those distance errors blow up. So ours are contained. They're never wrong by more than 22.2%. And um, we were able to show that uh, this particular projection with its uniform scale was gonna beat any other uh, two-sided disk maps, equal or beat any other two-sided disk maps you might come up with. So um, when, uh, another comment I might make is that if you take that old high school map, take it off the wall and bend it into a cylinder and tape it together, you could heal that boundary cut in the Pacific. Uh, you'd still have bad distance errors up in the North and the South Pole, but you'd, you'd at least uh, lower that, this, uh, that uh, distance, um, uh, you'd lower the distance errors and you would heal that interruption in the map. Uh, cartographers have long known that the more interruptions you put in, the more accurate your local variables can be. But uh, they're disturbing to have your, your um, airplane trips interrupted on the map. And so uh, ours has no boundary cut. Well, that, that uh, cylinder map would improve things by making it a cylinder. Um, however, uh, the analogy I would like to make is that uh, Edison came out with records, phonograph records, they were cylinders, but they're hard to store. So eventually we came to flat phonograph records. A man named Berliner came up with this idea. And so we're, we have songs on both sides of the record. And uh, uh, so our map is like that. And um, you can have maps like this of, um, of uh, planets. And uh, we, we show ones in our, our paper. We've made, uh, with Bob's help, we've made uh, maps of uh, 
uh, um, different planets and uh, the moon and uh, things like that, as well as um, um, the, the Earth. But this is the most accurate flat map of the Earth yet. And we've done it intentionally. This is like Mr. Um, Mr. Fosbury in 1968 came up to the high jump and he jumped over backwards, <laughs> bending his body, arching it over the over the pole, over the uh, over the horizontal bar. So the center of gravity went underneath the bar, and people were quite shocked at this. But um, it's been the way we've been doing the high jump ever since. So we're like that. We've, we've made this map uh, intentionally to uh, make uh, these six errors go down. And so we're making a new um, map projection uh, to do exactly that. So um, it's a fun new thing that hopefully people will enjoy having. And, uh, Exciting. Well, Professor Vanderbay, Bob, you're a professor of operations research and financial engineering. Also, I know you, you teach uh, astrophotography as well. What were some of the uh, challenges here? And tell me about your involvement. Uh, my involvement's mostly computer programming, <laughs> mostly making the maps. Um, so Richard minimized the uh, <laughs> the errors and told me what the formula is that I should be using. So I, my contribution is mainly uh, a contribution of doing the programming to actually make the maps. So for me, the biggest challenge was putting the city names on in the right place. <laughs> really, really interesting. You know, to, to a, a lay person or maybe a kid, if I brought this to my this problem to my five-year-old grandson described tried to describe what you're doing he would might say well can't you take a razor blade and go around the equator on my globe and kind of flatten them down together yes is, is that what would what you'd come up with that's exactly the idea that sticks in my brain the whole time and in fact um in my conversation with richard rather than taking a razor blade which is cutting it, which cartographers don't like to think that way. Uh, we had a different way of saying essentially the exact same thing. Instead of cutting it into two pieces and then flattening it, you could flatten it while it's before you, without cutting, you could just squish it. But I like to think, squishing it, if you think of a rubber ball and you squish it, it kind of won't go nice and flat. So I like to think of it a slightly different way. Insert inside the ball, a metal ring around the equator. And this ring can be enlarged. Don't know technology exactly how you would do it, but imagine you can have this metal, stiff metal ring in the equator inside your ball, and you could just push a button and make it bigger. And as you make it bigger, you're stretching the ball out. It's not gonna be a big round sphere anymore. It's gonna flatten out a little bit. And so keep pushing, pushing, pushing until it's flat. And I actually did the math of this just the other day and figured out what exact shape that would be. And it's, and it's a complicated mathematical thing called the differential equation, but I have software that was able to solve this differential equation numerically, not analytically. And the solution is almost identical to what Richard's, um, description of the new map is almost identical. It's amazing how close they are. Well, Richard, maybe you wanted to, to tell us what drew you into this, why you decided this is something you wanted to tackle. Well, I've always been interested in maps. Um, when I was a kid, I was 14 years old. I had a book about Mars and it had a Mercator, that, that same map that your teacher had in high school. Um, it had a Mercator map of Mars made by uh, an Italian uh, astronomer. And um, so I took that, I, I, I made, I painted a globe based on that Mercator map. So I made a globe of Mars when I was 14. That was like one of my first science projects. And, um, and, and so I've always been interested in maps. Um, what gave me the idea for this was that I was, um, I wrote a paper recently 
on something called envelope polyhedra. This is a new class of polyhedra that are, um, uh, they allow polygons to appear back to back and you get a lot of complicated structures. There's, there's one that's hollow. Uh, it has holes in it connecting in, interior faces with exterior faces. It's a, it's a regular polyhedron that has um, 36 square faces and they meet at six at a point. Whereas we're used to the cube, which is a, um, um, uh, which is a regular polyhedron that meets three squares around a point, you know, the, the, the ceiling and the two walls of a room. So uh, a cube is the regular polyhedron with square faces we're used to. And uh, the, uh, these are new ones that are more complicated, but they allow polyhedrons to appear back to back. So there's a square on the outside and then there's an edge and then there's a square on the inside. So you can also have two squares back to back. This was, uh, uh, those had been noted before. Um, there's, there's like squares appearing two around a point. Um, and those have been mentioned by a man named Mr. Coxeter about 1937. Um, and, and so I remembered that there was an old map projection that by a man named Geo, G-U-Y-O-T, uh, 1886, that was a map of the earth that was um, a, a rectangle, two by one. It was basically two squares. And one square on the left-hand side had the Western hemisphere in it. And one square had the right or the, the Eastern hemisphere in it. And they were sort of uh, joined like twins, conjoined twins in the middle. And, and, and it was a nice rectangular map. And it was um, also had perfect shapes, but the areas were bad at the corners and stuff like this. But I realized that if you could fold that backwards, like a bill fold, so that the back folded back, you, you could tape it together, and then you have a square envelope. And, and this was, um, uh, you'd have, you could, you could put this map on a Christmas card envelope, you know, the Northern hemisphere would be on the front, the Southern hemisphere would be on the back and it would be square. But I realized it'd be much better if it were round, it'd be more accurate if the hemisphere looks round. So you can show that mathematically it'd be best if it were round. And then I came up with the idea of the round phonograph record map that uses both sides of the piece of paper. So it was sort of a circuitous way of, of thinking of it, but um, that's true in science. You get um, uh, connections between different fields, uh, polyhedrons, for example, and I knew all about polyhedral globes. I told you about the one that Mr. Fuller made, and there've been ones made like that before him. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I made that connection between polyhedrons and maps through Fuller and others that had made those. And then also I realized that you could make a back-to-back -back map. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like uh, showing up at the boat race with a catamaran <laughs> instead of a single shell <laughs> uh, ship. People, people say, what is that boat? <laughs> It's interesting. You can do this with with your map, either showing the the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere on on the two sides, or eastern and western hemisphere, right? Yes, you you can take your pick. And some people, if you like a eastern western hemisphere version, we can we can make you one. In fact, we show one in our paper. And there's a place where an eastern and western hemisphere one works particularly well. That's in the moon. Here's a, I have a moon one here. And uh, on the moon, since we see one side of the moon always facing us, and the other side is the back side of the moon, which is always facing away from the Earth. So you can show the near side of the moon you're familiar with on one side, and the back of the moon, what you're missing, what the astronauts see when they go to the moon, the back side of the moon, uh, you can put that on the back. So an Eastern and Western Hemisphere version might be one that would have good application, let's say, if you wanted to uh, hang it from your ceiling over your dinner table, you know, like a chandelier, you know, then, then the wind would blow it in the wind, you know, and it would ro rotate and so forth. Um, a disadvantage of our map is that you can't see all of it at once. However, um, 
this, should there be an error term for this? Um, you can only see half of our map at once. Uh, should there be an error term for this? Well, uh, no, because the object of a map is to be as much like the globe as possible. And if you have a globe, you can only see half of it once and you have to rotate it to see the other half. And so in our case, uh, you just have to uh, flip it over to see the other half. And the same, can, same would be true if you were looking down at your globe. Yes, for this, but there's an Eastern Western hemisphere sure, version sure. also. Uh, and the reason I picked the polar one uh, was that the, um, Latitude longitude grid is simpler there. The longitude lines are all straight and the scale on them is constant. That's a nice property. And the, the, the latitude lines are circular. This is, uh, makes the map a be beautiful map for Jupiter this way where the, um, uh, and the equator is a, a universal uh, way to cut. The North and South Poles are special. And when we split it in longitude, that's a human invention of where to split it. You can split it along any longitude line. Um, and so um, also the, the northern one shows more airplane routes continuously. Bob, tell them, you've flown from uh, where to where? <laughs> My wife is Thai. So we fly to Thailand every couple of years. And once we had a direct flight from, um, from uh, New York City to uh, to Bangkok, and got on the airplane, and it's a 18 hour flight or something like that. So everybody just sort of sleeps, <laughs> and I'm sleeping, and the captain gets on the intercom, and says, "Those of you sitting on the right side of the plane, look out the window." And no, the the engine didn't blow up. <laughs> we were flying right over the North Pole. <laughs> He said, wow. that's the, of course it was cloudy, didn't actually see any snow or ice, we just saw clouds, but he said, that's the North Pole right there. <laughs> and so, you know, a straight line from New York to Bangkok does not go through Europe. It does not go past Hawaii, it goes over the top. <laughs> and, so and, and looking at the, the, the maps that you've developed, you can clearly see that, what the, what the shortest distance would be between the countries or cities. Yeah. So yeah. What, are, what are your yeah. hopes for the, the way these new maps will be used? Bob, do you, you wanna talk about that some and then Richard? Uh, well, I hope they'll be used in a way of being popular because going back in my own life, when I was only seven years, eight years old, seven years old, we did a family vacation by car back in those days. We drove from Michigan to Banff, Canada, which is a couple days drive. And I was only going into third grade, sitting in the backseat of the car, and I learned how to read a map. <laughs> I could pay attention to where my dad was driving the car. And it was interesting. And, and so, yes, maps are interesting. They're interesting for pretty much everybody. And this is a nicer way of making a map. Well, another interesting thing is, of course, if you just have a map of Michigan, it's, all kinds of different projections will look pretty much the same because it's a small fraction of the whole sphere. And so state maps, it's, it's not as much of a big deal as if you wanna have say the entire United States to look good or the entire hemisphere or the entire earth. And so um, it's a little bit less important at the local level. A map of New York City doesn't matter what the projections are. And I still like to look at those maps as well. But, uh, but at some scale, you like to look at big maps and, and having a better one is, is, is an improvement. Richard? Well, so you could, um, you could put these, these in, in a book or a magazine. For example, the National Geographic often includes a, a fold up map. That in its issue uh, when it seals it up. And, and you can insert one of these maps into that. You can insert a map like that into a book. You could have a, uh, where you could cut it out of a page of a magazine. Um, you could have um, a uh, phonograph records are, are efficient way to show things. 
this is, uh, and the best this economic scale is about 12 inches across. That's a long plane phonograph record. So you could have a map of the earth with a scale of about a thousand miles per, um, um, uh, per inch um, in, in a phonograph record. Um, you could have a stack of maps, I think, of all the planets in the solar system in a little box, you know, that you could, um, uh, they'd be like Frisbees, you know, you could put them out on the ground, you know, and so forth. You could flip them over. Frisbees, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could fly your, your, your planets. You and know? maybe the phonographs too. You just have to think of which song you want on the phonograph. You want the whole exactly. world in his hands or you want <laughs> what a right. wonderful world. <laughs> we are the world. Yeah, yeah, it would be good for, yes, uh, uh, maybe some um, artist would, who made an appropriate record might use this to color his vinyl um, uh, record. Um, yes, that would, that's a good idea. And um, uh, also you could, you could hang them up and so forth um, in your, uh, above your dining room table, let's say. Uh, so I think they would have some applications and also, it's like a project, I think, for kids. If you get one printed on both sides of the paper, they could cut them out and, and make their own map and so forth. So um, it's a way of teaching people about the world and its um, geometry. I'll say this about our map. We, we made, it shows geographical features and, um, and it shows the, the cities. They're the 50 largest population cities in the world. Um, People say you can date a world map usually by what's on it. And they usually don't put dates on world maps because you can, you'd like them to stay accurate for a long time, but country boundaries change all the time. So if you look carefully at your earth globe, you'll figure out what year it was made. Um, so we just put the cities on there, figuring they would change more slowly than any country boundaries we put. If we put in all the country boundaries, something's going to change. <laughs> but we figure the cities will be around for a while. Let's hope so. So uh, <laughs> go, going going forward with this, we're going to include a link that people can actually uh, download this, print it out. Double-sided printing, I guess, works best here, right? Yes. Uh, you, you can instruct um, your printer to print double-sided. People use this to make their say paper, you know, uh, when they print their documents. And, and you have to follow the instructions on your particular printer for how to do the double-sided printing. You may have to put the paper in the, in the slot again, you know, rotate it and so forth. Whatever instructions they give you for double-sided printing, we have made a, a, um, a printed version, uh, a downloadable version. So you can, the map's about seven inches across, and, and you can um, uh, print it on both sides of the paper and then get your scissors and carefully cut it out along the circumference and you'll have your, um, your uh, best resolution copy of our uh, nice, nice map that uh, Bob has artistically uh, produced. Bob, how, how well will this translate to online or the screens that everybody uses every day? Oh, that's I mean, it, it allows you to zoom in and out, I suppose. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question because there's another aspect here. We're trying to make three dimensions into two dimensions, but on the computer, we have three dimensions. We have left and right and time. <laughs> and so I have a web page where I have globes and planets and stuff, and they're three-dimensional blobs. You see a two-dimensional space, but I have them rotate because in the brain, you see something rotate and your brain makes that into a three-dimensional object. So it'll be interesting to see how this two-dimensional projection on the internet will compete <laughs> with a three-dimensional ball rotating. <laughs> well, but as, as Rich said, though, you can take the disc and do an animation of it as well. And that's also interesting. We have a we have a, a gif that shows it rotating and flipping over, so you can appreciate it um, online. Um, this is a um, this is a place for the regular uh, print media to uh, 
try to make a score here because this is a, this is an object that you can hold it. People people sometimes say they have too much screen time. This is an object you can actually hold in your hand. So as as I said, um, this is um, the Winkle Triple is a map you can put on your wall. This is a map, a more accurate one you can hold in your hand. It's a flat globe. Excellent. Well, congratulations on the work and getting this out there and looking forward to, to seeing these all over the place, uh, Frisbees records and people holding them in their hand. Richard God and Bob Vanderbay, thanks for taking the time with us. This was a lot of fun. Now this. It takes a lot of listening to build a better radio, and that's just what the folks at Sea Crane have done. Bob Crane and his crew, nestled among the rivers and tallest trees in the world in Fortuna, California, have made a habit of listening to their customers. And that's just what they've done in building the CC Skywave SSB, the Swiss Army knife of portable radios. For everyday listening to AM or FM in the yard or patio or on the nightstand, without having to drain a mobile phone battery, it's a great companion but it is also a companion equipped for NOAA weather information and alerts that can be life-saving. You can listen to FEMA and Coast Guard transmissions too. Beyond all of that, you can tune into shortwave signals from around the world. It's compact, easy to take with you, and built to last. The CC SkyWave SSB. Click on the link at textonation.com.